reading. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord warned him, You may eat freely of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Genesis 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals, and the Lord, the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we can eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fruit, sorry. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let's now stand and sing our gospel hymn, Purify Me. Our gospel reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, God will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to a peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. This is the Gospel of Christ. This morning I'm going to talk to you about three aspects of Kenya that impacted me. The first one is cooking. The second one was the children, and the third one is the church in Kenya. And in my presentation, I've got a series of photos. Some of them I'm not going to speak to. They are self-explanatory, and I'm not going to say a word about them. And that's one of them. <laughs> so I want to first of all start just with a Bible reading. It's one which we referred to quite a bit when we were in Kenya. It's from the book of John, chapter 5, verses 2 to 6. And it was near the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool in Hebrew called Bethsaida with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people 
blind, crippled, paralysed, were in those alcoves. One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, Do you want to get well? And the sick man said, Sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get there, somebody else is already in. But Jesus said, Get up, take your bedroll, start walking. The man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and walked off. So I'll explain why we referred to this later. Um, but it was one that we kept referring back to as we tried to process some of the things that we saw and experienced in Kenya. So we'll go on to the first slide. Um, just a quick background, there were 38 of us on the trip, 8 from Christchurch, 30 from Nelson. It was an encounter trip, not a mission trip, and that means we went to Kenya to encounter God in a different culture. We can't go into a culture we don't know. We, we see the problems, we have no idea what the underlying issues are. It was for us to experience Africa and Kenya. So, we, on our First week there, um, I went to this orphanage called the Garden of Hope. And this is a photo. They have a primary school as well on the orphanage grounds. It's on the outskirts of Nairobi. They have about 50, 60 orphans living there. And then they have a further 90 children that attend the primary school. So 150 children under their care there. The orphans, some of them are orphans, proper orphans. They've lost their parents, uh, their parents have died or they've been abandoned and that their families are untraceable. The other children that live in the orphanage, they are from the surrounding villages. There's a lot of poverty in this area and it's very hard for the um, parents to raise their children and come up with the school fees and clothe them and feed them. So this orphanage will take one child from a family, only one, not two, and they get to live in the orphanage, they get the education is paid for, their food is paid for, and in the school holidays they go back home to the family home and spend that time with their family and their siblings. Um, so we got taken on a tour of the orphanage, and you'll see the next slide is a bunk room. This is the bunk room for 26 girls, there was also a nursery. The children ranged in age from two to, through to about 16, 17 when they finished school. They asked us, when we first arrived there, we were taken into a small meeting room and we were done, introductions were done. Jeff, who's one of the Kiwis, he's a, a dad in his 40s, he sat down and this two-year-old little boy just clung on to him wrapped his arms around him, it was a cling-on, his head was nestled into Jeff's neck, and it just broke all our hearts, this child so needed to have some love and attention, some cuddles, some, some warmth from an adult, that you know, a dad figure. Um, so it was very hard to reconcile the needs of these children with these attachments being formed and then us leaving at the end of the day. Uh, some of us were asked to volunteer to help in the kitchen, and here we are, this is the kitchen in the orphanage, and we were asked to chop the vegetables, a very, very simple task, but it was difficult. Some of that food had rotten bits in it, some of the food, the, the vegetables was quite dry on the outside, food that we wouldn't use, but we chopped it up, and um, then we got our, our assessment by the chefs, we failed, we did a bad job with it. The, the vegetables need to be chopped very, very finely, and the reason for that is that there's no eating utensils in the orphanage. So the, it needs to be cut very, very finely, and then the food is served on a plate. They get the ugali, which is the, the staple diet there. It's a cross between rice and potato. They get the ugali in their hand, dip it in the, the vegetable sauce, and then they eat like this. So the vegetables have to be chopped finely so that you can scoop it up and eat it. Right, we'll go through a couple of photos here. And then I want to show you the actual kitchen. It's a bit dark, this photo, but this is what it was like. There are windows there, but they are covered in smoke. We, uh, the cooking was done in a cauldron over a wooden fire. I was absolutely horrified. How can they cook for 50 children, plus there were 20 visitors there, in this dingy little room, there was poor ventilation, 
and um, asthmatics would start wheezing so they couldn't work in the kitchen. Across the corridor was a, a western style kitchen with two stoves in there and I couldn't understand why aren't they using the kitchen there that I'm familiar with and we thought maybe it's the cost of electricity, maybe it's the cost of the gas, we didn't even know what they ran the, the stoves on. Um, but anyway, a nutritious meal was prepared, we all ate it, nobody got food poisoning. Okay, Kiwi, hold your thoughts in, and off we go to the next place. Uh, we then visited a, um, a very small slum that was about two kilometres from where we were staying, and uh, again, I helped with the cooking. This time it's a cooking shed that is separate to the building. It had good ventilation. And again, it was a giant cauldron over the fire with some uh, wood underneath. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe because we're in these slums, maybe that's why they're cooking in such a primitive way. But I didn't vocalise it out loud. Um, if you see the next slide, you will see that a beautiful, nutritious meal has been prepared. And uh, these are volunteers from Nairobi Chapel who are dishing out the food. Again, there were no utensils. We ate off the plates with our hands. Now, this particular project that you're seeing here is one that Nairobi Chapel has oversight of. During the week, this facility is a community centre and a school. For, and on a Saturday morning, Nairobi Chapel um, takes over the buildings. There's three very small classrooms. They cram in about 90 primary aged children and they do Bible lessons on a Saturday morning. And the way that the children, that they entice the children to come is at the end of it they get that beautiful, big, nutritious meal. It's probably the best meal that they get in the week. And again, it was a vegetarian meal. Um, as part of our visit there, we went down to a sports field and we got to hang out with some of the children. And uh, a lot of other villagers joined us at that stage, and a 15-year-old girl was very curious. Why are you in Kenya? What are you doing here? What do you like about Kenya? And my response to that was, well, I really love being in a country that's 80% Christian. And everywhere we go, we see Christian messages on buildings, on buses, on trucks. People are praying out in public. There's no fear of being a Christian in this country. And she was you know, 15 year olds, what? what? Well, what's your country like? And I was like, well, very few people believe in Christianity anymore. And she's like, but why? You have to believe in something. Why don't they believe in God? And I said, well, maybe, maybe it's because we have some wealth in our country. We have money. When people are comfortable, they feel that they don't have a need for God. And so we have a very secular nation. And this 15-year-old, she thought about it and said, ah, so they worship the god of money. And I was just really struck that a 15-year-old who lives in a slum can come up with something that, that, that's that thought-provoking and um, insightful. And she, she just, as far as she was concerned, everybody needs to have a belief in a god. And if you haven't got a belief in god, what do you believe in? So my next cooking experience on the next slide Oh, that's not quite cooking, we didn't eat any elephant. Um, <laughs> the next slide, we went and visited Shiro's grandmother. And this was, this was one of the highlights of our trip. She lives at about an hour north of Nairobi on a plantation. She grows tea leaves and coffee beans. And she lives in this lovely wee three bedroom bungalow on the top of the hill with spectacular views. And on the side of her house, you can see this small building. And you can probably guess what this building is. It's the cookhouse. And I put my head inside and I look and I go, my goodness, there's another one of these giant cauldrons, an open wooden fire, and I'm in the home of this highly educated, intelligent woman who's had a great career. She's raised all these beautiful children and grandchildren, and she's got cooking on a cauldron in the cookhouse. Now, the, re I'll, the reason we went to this house, and I'll call her Shosho, Shosho is the word for grandmother, and we all called her Shosho, because her family, every summer holidays, they run a Bible school for primary age children, and they go around about 10 different villages, and this year, it was in her village. And Shiro and her siblings and all their extended family come and run these camps. And we were part of the volunteer workers for those camps. So there were 30 of us staying at Shosho's house. We were sleeping in bunk rooms and on the floor and in tents and all over the place. So 
Shosho was catering for 30 people. And she does have a Western kitchen, but she doesn't use it when she's catering for those numbers. It's inadequate. And she goes back to the traditional method, and she, they cook up these huge pots of nutritious food, and no one gets any food poisoning. So I really had to take off my Kiwi hat and go, actually, there's something really good happening here. Some of these traditional methods are far better than, than what our Western um, appliances could have produced for those sorts of crowds, crowds. And I had to look back at those other two places I'd visited and just eat a bit of humble pie myself and realise we don't know the best way of doing everything. Next slide. This was our bathroom. Um, we would walk down through the tea plantation to the pond, to the waterfall. We swam here every day. It was just the most beautiful experience. The children's camp that we helped out at, it was held at the local church. There were about 120 children attended. It was focused around Psalm 23. At the end of the week, all of those children could recite Psalm 23 by heart. And we all just had an amazing time there with the children, with Shiro's extended family, walking through the tea plantations and uh, swimming in the pools. Our, our faces, we all just light up at the memories. We'll just move on through a couple of slides there. Oh, me and some African children. And we'll go to the next one. And I'm going to talk a bit about the church that hosted us, which was Nairobi Chapel. <clears throat> uh, this looks like a circus big top. And the reason it looks like a circus big top is because it is. Um, and that is where the main service is held at Nairobi Chapel. They have a huge campus there where their church is located, but they only have one permanent building on the site. All the services are held in tents like this. The adults in this big tent, the young adults in another slightly smaller tent, the, the youth and the intermediates all have their own tent where services are held. They have one permanent building, which I haven't got a photo of, sorry, but it's a container building. So it was very familiar to me coming from Christchurch. And that building is a primary school. And so in the week it's used as a primary school. Uh, most of the children uh, and their families are in the congregation at Nairobi Chapel. And in the weekends that's where Sunday school is held. Now, at Nairobi Chapel, they have VIPs, and they're very open about the segregation that they have at their church. In their church, the VIPs are the children. So if they have a project that they want to put money into, it will go to the children. If they've got two really good projects and they're humming and hiring, they'll say which one will have the biggest impact on the children, and that's where their time, their money, and their resources will go to. And it gives them a very simple business model and strategy for where they put their resources. The next show, slide shows um, their sports courts. Uh, obviously, it's used by the primary school children during the week. But after school, um, it's used as an outreach program. So the chapel is located about one kilometre from the Kaibera slum, which is the biggest slum in Africa. It's got about 150, 200,000 people living there. Um, the numbers are hard to estimate. And so in the afternoons, they have uh, sports outreach to some of the children from the slums. And they, they play football and basketball. And some of those teams are are uh, competing at national level. And along with that, of course, all the, the, um, <clears throat> the pastors involved in that, they are all discipling these children at the same time, helping with them with their life goals, helping them through the education system, helping them to get an education so they can get a job. The next slide is another project that I saw at Nairobi Chapel. This was located inside a container. They use lots of containers over there, so I felt very comfortable um, again. This one, as you can see, is a sewing room. They have treadle machines because um, electricity is a bit dodgy. Well, they have treadle machines. These are women from the Kaibera slum, again, and they learn to sew. When they complete their sewing course, <clears throat> Nairobi Chapel has business mentors and microfinancing. So they help these women to set up a business, to make goods that they can sell in the markets, and then they can, with that, they can buy food and feed their children. Also in that same container room, there were some ovens there. So they also have cooking programs, so the women can learn to cook, and then they can sell that product at markets and get an income for themselves. Another outreach project that they had there, which I didn't show, was in another container, opened the door, and inside there was a food bank. 
And when we visited a lot of the uh, projects and missions that Nairobi Chapel is involved in, they would take a couple of bags of meal with them that we would donate to those <coughs> um, orphanages and projects. The next slide is something very different, but again related to church. Here you have an apartment building, and um, I witnessed the birth of a church when I was there. It was in an apartment building very similar to this. Um, they have these buildings that have been built specifically for the young urban professionals, um, young Kenyans who've come from wealthy families, they've got their university degrees, they've got good jobs, and this is accommodation for them in Nairobi. It's all secure, keys, locks, security guards. Um, and up on the roof there's a swimming pool, there's a pizza parlour, there's a cafe. And Nairobi Chapel has moved into one of these buildings, taken a room out on the top floor, and they have started a church up there to disciple the young people, these young professionals, in that uh, building. Um, so I was there, there were 30 people at that very first church service that they held, and of those 30, probably half of us were associated with Nairobi Chapel, so that means about 12, 15 people from within the building went to that very first church service. There's about 900 people living in that building, so they've got a great mission field there. We then went up to the roof and looked at the view from the roof, and when I looked down, this is what I could see, and that's a mini slum. So literally at their doorsteps, they've, once these young urban professionals, um, if they want to do any outreach, it's literally on their doorstep. Um, one of the things at Nairobi Chapel, again, going back to the children, was very focused on was helping the children because if you can... I, I think maybe they see and hear of our stories from here in New Zealand that we've lost our faith, and so they're so intentional in looking after the children, discipling them and growing them up in faith. Um, so my one takeout, well, one takeout I have from all of this is that I really wanted to start some sort of a little project back here. And so I actually have borrowed an idea from somebody else, from Shirley, <laughs> and I thought, let's just start with the simplest thing that we could do here in our church. And it's just to start, I saw the food bank, and that's what inspired me to think, what if during this period of Lent, every week that we come to church, we just bring a tin of food, and every week, every time you visit church, bring some food, I'll put some baskets out, and at the end of Lent, we can donate this to the city mission. And it just gets us thinking about how can we be missional in our own church. And uh, that's me on my talk on children, cooking, and church. And I think there's one more slide just to finish on. Oh, I didn't explain about, sorry, the Bible verse at the beginning, um, the pool at Bethsaida, and why we kept reflecting back on that one. And it was because there's so much need out there. We can't help all the people who are in need. And Jesus was the same. It says there were hundreds of people in those alcoves and he healed one man. He didn't heal all the rest. All those other hundreds, he healed one. And so for us, if we can just do one thing to start with, for example, with food, bring it in, um, we can start and help in that very small way. discovered instant gravy for putting into pies and casseroles. Then I discovered spices. And in many ways, the differences I encountered between Kenya and the differences from here is like discovering cooking with spices. In Kenya, they are bold with, yes, their spices, but also with their colour seen on their Yep, people, um, houses, their dresses, and of course their beautiful clothes. And they also are um, bold, wonderfully bold with living out and displaying their Christian faith. Heather touched on this. They have Christian statements on, um, can we go to the transport slides? Yeah, um, on their cars, their buildings, I didn't catch that. Um, so just um, outside their shops, Chris, Christian statements everywhere, and they're wonderfully easy to talk to about Jesus and faith. Um, in the 2019 census, I came up with 85% Christian, 
Christian, he had 80, but okay, 85% Christian nation. Um, and so from the very young to the very old, striking up a conversation with them about Jesus as easy as in New Zealand talking about the weather. I found that incredibly refreshing and uplifting compared to New Zealand, where the culture at the moment is all about being woke, often to the detriment of professing one's faith, or the threat of being accused of hate speech or just simply being cancelled if you speak too loudly about your faith and your beliefs. To be honest, the comparisons between the two cultures and the way they do faith is like the difference between wearing camouflage to avoid running the risk of offending somebody or standing out too much, or two, wearing bright and vibrant colours to be seen and heard and noticed. I can sure you can guess which culture is which. It was also impossible not to be utterly humbled by the Kenyans Christians' outreach to the poor and the marginalised of which we saw so many examples. Too many to describe here, so I'll just mention one. If we can go to the Pastor Joe slide. Yeah, so it's a bit blurry there, but um, this is the Global Hope Rescue and Rehab Rehabilitation Centre set up by Pastor Joe. I'll just talk to the slide first. Um, so it's a home for street kids. Now, street kids are even below slum kids. They don't have anywhere. They sleep in whatever doorway they can find. They beg, steal, or borrow any food they can find. You know, they, they, they really are at the bottom. And Pastor Joe once was a street kid himself who was rescued from the streets and given a new start. He went on to get a degree in chemical engineering, but he felt so called by God to reach back into where he'd come from that he parked that degree and he set up this home. Now that guy there, he's, his beard is litter. He's lying in a rubbish heap. He's sniffing glue. On the right-hand side, there he is, suit, uh, shirt and tie. He's on his feet. He's got a career. And, you know, it's just um, so humbling to see that, you know, somebody who's... Pastor Joe, with his degree, just reached back in, and that's what he's done. And it, to, to me, it seems that Kenyans place a value on belonging, whether it's to your family, extended family, your community, which is most often church-based, and your tribe. Pastor Joe's big boys, his grown-up boys, I just say that the big boys slept two a bed, the younger boys slept three a bed. To us, it was a, actually pretty squalid. Um, you know, it was not somewhere we'd want to live, but these guys, these street boys, they just, you know, that was so much better than anything they'd had. Um, but anyway, the big boys that had been through the program and had graduated, they also came back out of that sense of belonging and that sense of putting back in that they had. And uh, they had the sense of being want to better the lives of those with who had come from the same place that they once did. They also seemed to have a depth of heartfelt willingness to reach into and better the lives of the poor and the needy. And I have to wonder if our Western culture's emphasis on the individual, and it's all about what, you feel, what makes you feel good, has come at the cost of having a group to connect with, somewhere to belong, especially in New Zealand's younger generation, sorry, but dark here, where our youth suicide rate is 18 deaths per 100,000, in Kenya it's only 6 deaths per 100,000 for suicide, and well, that's us, New Zealand at the top, we have the highest suicide rate in the OECD by quite a margin. So yeah, that impacted me, this lack of this sort of dark mental depression. Look, Kenya isn't without its problems. Poverty is huge. They estimate there are over three million in the Nairobi slums alone. Plastic pollution is rampant in an eyesore. Crime and the need for security and the awareness of your own personal safety is ever present. But the Kenyans, they have a freedom of expression that is enviable. They dance, man, they can dance. Don't ask me to try. Dance slide, uh, worship slide, yep. That's their worship group, yeah. <laughs> no, I couldn't. Um, 
They sing, they laugh a lot, and their grins are a mile wide. And I wonder if their freedom to be in this Christian nation comes from knowing Jesus and therefore having that sense of belonging. On our final day in Nairobi, the Nairobi Chapel staff team, just a mere staff team of eight, uh, 60, s- sat us down and one by one washed our feet as they prayed for us personally and prayed for us as we left their shores to return to our shores to take back with us the love, hope, joy, peace and freedom that comes from belonging to Christ and his global family. Which leaves me with the personal challenge of how do I impart the hope, joy and freedom that comes from knowing that you belong and that you belong to the global family that is Christ's family. And what does this look like practically for me? Well, I've signed up to be camp mum at Easter camp again. You know, I actually thought I'd done my dash, done my time. I thought I was too old, but... After Kenya, no, I, well, I just need to do something. But ongoing from here, I am left with a continual challenge of how do I bring salt, spice, light, colour back to New Zealand's mental health angst in the young that is our camouflage culture. Asante. That's thank you in Swahili. <laughs>